good morning, Grant Memorial. It's good to see you today. I hope that everyone is settling into their new fall routines, uh, including the change in our service times. Now, I'm not going to embarrass anyone by getting you to put your hand up, but I, I wonder how many of you have been here since, I don't know, 10, 15 or so, waiting for the service to start. I'm just going to leave that out there. None, you know, none of us, but I'm sure, you know, there might be somebody out there. Well, one thing that hasn't changed uh, is that we, is what we are studying on Sunday mornings. Uh, today, we find ourselves continuing in our series in Mark as we follow the life and ministry of Jesus as he makes his way to the cross where he will absolutely change everything. And we pick up today uh, just a couple days from his crucifixion, and wouldn't you know, Jesus is having another heated conversation with the religious leaders of his day as they seek to put a stop to his growing influence and ministry. And so, uh, would you turn with me in your copy of the scriptures to Mark chapter 12 as we read about this encounter together. If uh, you didn't bring a Bible uh, from home, there are some in the seats in front of you, and uh, we're going to be starting at Mark chapter 12 and verse 13. This is what it says. Later, they sent some of the Pharisees and Herodians to Jesus to catch him in his words. They came to him and said, Teacher, we know that you are a man of integrity. You aren't swayed by others because you pay no attention to who they are. But you teach the way of God in accordance with the truth. Is it right to pay the imperial tax to Caesar or not? Should we pay or shouldn't we? But Jesus knew their hypocrisy. Why are you trying to trap me, he asked. Bring me a denarius and let me look at it. They brought the coin and he asked them, whose image is this and whose inscription? Caesar's, they replied. Then Jesus said to them, give back to Caesar what is Caesar's and to God what is God's. And they were amazed at him. Heavenly Father, we thank you for your word. We pray today that as we encounter it, that you would allow it to jump off of the page into our hearts, into our minds, into our lives, that we would be different than how we came. Amen. Okay, so while this is a short passage, there's a lot going on in this text. And it starts with the statement right off the top in verse 13, that they sent some of the Pharisees and Herodians to Jesus to catch him in his words. Right, this is a weighty sentence that starts by telling us that this was not a chance encounter that Jesus had with these people here. Right? But rather, this encounter was orchestrated. Verse 13 starts by saying, they sent some of the Pharisees and Herodians. Now, who are the they in this passage? Right? Who are these tactical commanders coming after Jesus? Well, if we back up just one verse uh, to the end of last week's passage, we actually see who it is. So let's go back to verse 12, which we ended with last week, and read what it says. It says, Then the chief priests, the teachers of the law, and the elders looked for a way to arrest him because they knew he had spoken the, this parable against them. But they were afraid of the crowd, so they left him and went away. The they is the chief priests, the teachers of the law, and the elders, right? These are the ruling elite Jews, right? The, most likely, these are the members of the Sanhedrin or the Jewish Supreme Court whom Jesus had just offended by telling them that they were illegitimate, illegitimate murderers whom God has disinherited, disinherited from the promise due to their mistreatment of God's servants and disrespect of God. Now, if this isn't ringing a bell, I encourage you to go back and watch last week's message where Pastor Steve brilliantly walked us through uh, the parable of the tenants. And so, as they had numerous times already, this elite group, who did not like how Jesus talked about them and what they were doing, set out to stop Jesus, and specifically in this instance, to have him arrested, as we just read in verse 12. So, be sure that this was not a question of curiosity, right? This was not a genuine theological question for a teacher whom these men admired, but was, as the end of verse 13 says, an attempt to trap Jesus. This is a setup. And it's not the only one 
So far in the Gospel of Mark, the Pharisees have tried to trap Jesus by asking him about divorce in Mark 10, by demanding a sign from heaven in Mark 8. And now, now that they have Jesus in Jerusalem, this mission ramps up significantly. In fact, this question is the first of three questions in succession that the religious leaders ask with the purpose of trapping Jesus in his words. Right here, the Pharisees and Herodians ask about taxes. Uh, Next week, we're going to see in verse 18, the Sadducees ask Jesus about resurrection and marriage. And then in verse 28, one of the teachers of the law asks Jesus to simplify the law of God by asking him what the greatest or most important commandment is. These are four separate factions within Judaism who usually do not get along, all working together for one common purpose, to put an end to Jesus. And we see here the truth that Jesus unifies, right? Jesus brings people together. This is true both positively by binding his own people together from every corner of the earth and negatively as those who share Jesus as a common enemy unite themselves under the banner of Antichrist. And nowhere in the scriptures is this as plain as it is in this strange alliance of the Pharisees and Herodians. Now, this isn't the first time that we've seen these unlikely bedfellows, right? If you can remember all the way back, think months ago, in Mark chapter 3, after Jesus had healed a man with a shriveled hand on the Sabbath, the Pharisees went out and began to plot with the Herodians how they might kill Jesus, Mark 3, 6. Now, because uh, the last time we talked about these groups was actually so long ago, let's just recap who the Herodians and the Pharisees are so we're on the same page. The Pharisees were an uber-conservative religious party within Judaism, right? Who were for religious piety and righteousness through strict adherence to the Old Testament law, to the Torah, right? There was really no give or take what the Torah said you needed to do uh, in addition to all sorts of other qualifications that they had come come up with over time. And, and in addition to standing for this and kind of forcing this strict adherence on people, they also stood against uh, what's referred to as Hellenization or the secularization of Israel, right? The submission of, of the Jews to the ruling Roman authorities, right? They believed that they should stand on their own as their own entity and not submit under Rome. Well, the Herodians, on the other hand, were a political party, right? They weren't a religious party. They were a political party that was loyal to the rule of Herod. And Herod is the same one that we read about at Christmas time, and his dynasty, right? Hence the name Herodians, right? The, and, the, and the Herodians were known for sensuality, for corrupt living, and, and ruling dishonestly. They were not interested at all in religious piety, and they fought for the Hellenization of the Jews as they served as the go-betweens for the Jews and the Romans. In Almost every possible spectrum, from religious to political, the Herodians and the Pharisees stood on opposite ends of the scale, often in public disagreement with one another, and yet here they come together in opposition to Jesus, living out the expression, my enemy's enemy is my friend. Okay, so the Sanhedrin sent members of these two groups as one to try and trap Jesus, asking him a public question Uh, Partially because these two groups represented the two distinct ideals represented by the very question they were asking. Uh, Verse 14 says, They came to him and said, Teacher, we know that you're a man of integrity. You aren't swayed by others because you'd pay no attention to who they are. But you teach the way of God in accordance with the truth. Is it right to pay the imperial tax to Caesar or not? Notice that they don't simply ask the question, but rather they begin with flattery. Right? Does anyone else have experience with this? Perhaps with a spouse or something? Right? Honey, you're so beautiful. I just love you so much. You're so kind and understanding. On a completely unrelated note, I just smashed the car. Right? (laughs) You kind of, you know, set them up to live out the qualities that you've just affirmed in them. Right? I think many of us have been there in one way or another. Well, that is what the antagonists are doing here. Right? It's all a part of the plan to butter up Jesus, to force him to into as simple of an answer as possible, right? And in their flattery, what we see is an incredible irony, 
right? The, the reality is that even though they themselves do not believe what they're saying about Jesus, what they are saying about Jesus is true nonetheless, right? They, they say that Jesus is a man of integrity, verse 14a, and he is, right? Jesus is not dishonest. He tells the truth. He lives in light of that truth. He does what he says, and he says what he does. But the ironic part is that the very ones saying that Jesus is a man of integrity, praising him for that trait, are not themselves acting with integrity, right? They are lying to flatter Jesus. They're trying to trap him by veiling their question with deceit. Now, how they don't notice this, I don't know. But it's also ironic because if what they say is true, that Jesus is not swayed, they should have known that their flattery wouldn't have swayed him. Then they go on to say that Jesus is impartial. Right? He's a man of integrity and he is impartial. Verse 14b, you aren't swayed by others because you pay no attention to who they are. Right Now, that is not saying that Jesus doesn't care about the individual or anything like that. But what they're saying is that Jesus remains the same no matter who is watching. Right? He, he's not like that politician who changes their direction uh, depending on which way the wind is blowing or is currently popular among the people. Right? He doesn't put weight in status or clout in social standing. Right? Jesus is consistent and true no matter what people may think or who it is that may disagree with him. Which again exposes the irony here. Those telling Jesus that he is virtuous because he doesn't put worth in status are precisely the ones who care the most about their status. Right? The reason they're even trying to trap Jesus in the first place is that they fear their influence will diminish if Jesus keeps on doing what it is that he's doing. Right? These words of the Pharisees and Herodians are an inventory of what Jesus is and what they certainly are not. And then they end their flattery by saying in verse 14c, you teach the way of God in accordance with the truth. Which we know, right, as readers of this gospel so far, right, we know this is true. Jesus is the Messiah, the very Son of God. This has been the thesis of all we have read, and Jesus has proven it over and over again. But this crew, the ones asking the very question, doesn't believe what they're saying here. Right? That Jesus speaks on behalf of God and his way. Right? Because if they did, they wouldn't be trying to trap him. They would be seeking to follow him. Right? These men, in trying to flatter Jesus, do speak truth. But at the same time, they expose themselves as liars. And what they're trying to do is force Jesus to live up to these statements and answer this question on their terms. Which brings us to the question itself, which is, should we pay taxes to Caesar? Right? Should we pay taxes to Caesar? That's the official question that is being asked, right? Should we pay the imperial tax? Now, the tax that they're referring to was known as the poll tax or the head tax, levied on all people living in any of the Roman provinces. And because Judea was under Roman control at the time, all of its subjects were required to pay this tax. Now, this tax was in addition to taxes for the sale of land or other societal, military, and economic levies. This was simply a tax that you paid for existing, right? And, and the tax cost a denarius, which was roughly a day's wage for a laborer at the time. And this was one of the most controversial issues for Jews of the day. Because for many Jews, paying taxes to Rome was seen as treasonous, since they saw themselves as a theocracy, meaning that, that God was their only Lord and Master, and so to submit to another Lord was to reject Israel. In, in fact, when this tax was first instituted in year six of the Common Era, there was a Jewish revolt led by a fellow named Judas the Galilean that was violently put down by the Romans. But according to Josephus, the historian, first century Jewish historian, this Judas, in rallying people up, claimed that they were cowards 
if they would endure to pay a tax to the Romans and would after God submit to mortal men as their lords. And while this revolt itself had been snuffed out decades before Jesus was talking, this sentiment still existed among the people who were already living under severe oppression and so despised the Romans and their tax. Now one important uh, thing to note is that at this particular time, there were no real classes in Roman-occupied Israel, right? To, to a degree not known before, Roman occupation divided the world between the haves and the have-nots with very little in between. There was no middle class. And so aside from the ruling elite, there was no one for which this tax was, you know, not a big deal, or financially inconsequential, right? All were hurt by this tax and struggled to pay because just about everyone was poor, which hints at why this particular question is a trap. You see, either way that Jesus answers this question, if taxes ought to be paid or not, he's in danger of compromising his position with either the people with whom his, he and his teaching had become popular or with the Roman authorities that they were all subject to. Right? On one hand, if Jesus affirms Rome's right to tax them, he will anger the people who feel oppressed by this tax. And ticking off a mob in a city that is swelled to over three times its size during the Feast of Unleavened Bread is quite a dangerous proposition. Especially considering that these people were waiting for the Messiah to come to specifically rescue them out from under Roman's Rome. Rome's thumb, right? What kind of Messiah would tell the people to pay taxes to Rome, the very empire he's supposed to overthrow? And so answering this way puts Jesus in danger of turning the people off from the idea that he's the Messiah, therefore losing his credibility and perhaps initiating his execution based off of his own claims of who he is. Well, on the other hand, if Jesus stands with the people and says not to pay their taxes, that Rome has no right over their money, over their livelihoods, he's risking an immediate arrest, potentially more, on the spot because the city is full of Roman officials who have no need for a leader to rise up, encouraging the people to rise up against Rome. Jesus here is caught between a proverbial rock and a hard place, right? And and those asking the question do everything they can to keep him there. I notice the question that, or the, the, the way that the religious leaders ask this question. Verse 15. They ask it kind of again. They say, should we pay or shouldn't we? Right? Should we pay or shouldn't we? They ask Jesus a yes or no question. This is not open-ended. So Jesus, you know, provide commentary on this for us. It's, it's a yes or no question. It's pick A or B. Now, you've got to give it to the Pharisees here. They're adjusting their tactics, right? They've not had a lot of success with their open-ended questions of Jesus before, have they? Right? In just the last conversation that we talked about last week, they made the mistake of asking an open-ended question Jesus, who gave you the authority to do this? And by the end of Jesus' response, they had been dubbed illegitimate and murderous, and they were the ones who came off sounding ignorant of the ways of God. And so this time, they ask a yes or no question. Should we or shouldn't we? And they had done everything they could in their flattery to force Jesus to make a simple statement by defining him as someone who speaks the cold, hard truth no matter what. This tactic is known in the philosophical world as a loaded question, or in the media as a gotcha question, right? With this type of question, the options are presented, but the options are limited, usually predefined, and neither option is good for the one answering the question. So the classic example in a philosophy textbook of a gotcha question or a loaded question would be, have you stopped beating your wife? And what makes that a gotcha question is that either way you answer, you declare yourself guilty, right? If I say I've not stopped beating my wife, well, that's not good, right? I'm admitting guilt. If I say that I have stopped beating my wife, I'm admitting previous guilt, right? There's no good way to answer that question if the options are limited to yes or no. And in a sense, 
Uh, the Pharisees and the Herodians are doing this to Jesus. They limit his options. Should we pay or shouldn't we? Yes or no, Jesus. Well, Jesus, not having any of it, does not play their game. Right? As if they couldn't see this coming. But Now, uh, that is not to say that Jesus doesn't answer their question. He certainly does. But he doesn't limit himself to the simplicity of their yes and no options. Rather, he begins by pointing out their malicious intent of their question to begin with. Verse 15. But Jesus knew their hypocrisy. Why are you trying to trap me, he said. Right? Jesus points out to all who are there that this question is loaded and is not being asked out of curiosity, right, out of genuine concern, but that something else is going on here. And then Jesus, as he always does, through parable or object lesson, brings the question to life. Verse 15 at the end. Bring me a denarius and let me look at it. They brought him the coin. Now, remember how much a denarius is? Right? This is a typical day's wage, right? And notice that Jesus didn't have it on him. Right? He didn't pull one out of his pocket or out of his satchel. But he needed them to provide the coin, right? And here's the other curious thing. They, the Pharisees and Herodians, did have a denarius on them. Right? Remember the two classes we talked about? The haves and the have-nots? A denarius would likely have been a difficult thing for most in the crowd to produce on the spot, unless they had just been paid, like moments earlier. But to the religious leaders, the coin was easy to produce, because they likely had multiple denarii between them. Right Here, if subtly, Jesus points out to the crowd the differences between them and the leaders pretending to represent them. Right? It's the very ones who are not hurt by this tax, who have denarii to spare, who are asking about it. Right? This is simply a matter of principle to them, a mere question of theological debate, while to the crowd present, including Jesus and his followers, it meant much, much more than that. Now before we move on, here's an interesting question to ask. How is it that they would have come to have this money? Right, the Herodians and Pharisees, where did they get their money from? Taxes. Right? Taxes. That's how they got paid too. The, the temple tax for the Pharisees or the taxes that Herod collected to pass on to Rome that came through his party, the Herodians. Right? The Pharisees, think about the irony in this. The Pharisees are asking if people should be subject to paying taxes to the big bad Romans totally oblivious to the fact that their taxes, that which they live off of, are oppressive to the people as well. The coin that they so easily produced likely came from the very people in that crowd who couldn't produce it themselves. It's funny how we notice the injustices that hurt us much more easily than the ones that benefit us. Well, the Pharisees and the Herodians produce the denarius, and Jesus, true to form, uses it as an object lesson. Verse 16b. Jesus asked them, whose image is this and whose inscription? Caesar's, they answered. Jesus, in turning the question around, puts the answer that they were trying to trap him with on their own lips. Right? He forces them to be the ones to say it. And in addition to that, he points out the hypocrisy that their pockets were lined with the image of Caesar. Right? If they were to assert that paying tax to Caesar was treasonous, it was wrong, why were they benefiting off of his economic system? Right? Whether they wanted to admit it or not, they were already participating in Rome's economic system. They were already complicit in the kingdom of this world. They were already submitting to Caesar's lordship. Right? And this is accentuated by what we know of the bust and inscription on the denarius. Right? And it's behind me there. Right? At this point in history, the coin, uh, the denarius, had on the front the image of Tiberius Caesar, who ruled from the year 14 to 37. And it was accompanied around the outside by the inscription, Tiberius Caesar, son of the divine Augustus, right? Or God's son, 
Well, the reverse side of the coin had the inscription Pontifus Maximus, which means high priest. Quite something, isn't it? Right? This coin declared the divinity of Tiberius Caesar and his role as high priest over all. How's that for blasphemy? And the Pharisees and other religious leaders seemed to be happy to participate in the economic system that presented Caesar in this way. Right? They were happy to collect his money and to spend his money. They were happy to live off of his money. The only issue that they really had was in giving any of it back to Caesar. They were fine collecting Caesar's coins, but they certainly didn't want Caesar taking any of it back. Well, after it's pointed out that the coin bears the image and the name of Caesar, Jesus points out now what seems to be obvious. Verse 17, then Jesus said to them, give back to Caesar what is Caesar's. Notice the wording in Jesus' answer. He uses the term return, right? Give back to Caesar, right? Jesus says, where did you get that coin, right? Where did this coin originate, You obviously got it from Caesar. It has his name and his picture literally on it. It wasn't yours to begin with. So if he asks for it back through taxes or otherwise, give it back to him. It's like he's saying you're you're already participating in Rome's system. And if you're going to live in the world and participate in the world's game, you need to live by the world's rules. Right? Money, economic systems are of this world. So money and worldly economic systems belong to this world. The, this coin is Caesar's. And if you have one, you're under Caesar's system. So pay him the taxes. And here, friends, is where we need to stop and ponder a little bit ourselves. If there was any doubt, and I hope there's not much doubt, but if there was any doubt if Christians should pay their taxes... Let me say this loud and clear. Yes. Right? Yes. We are to pay our taxes. But there's a little bit more going on here, right? Beyond that, beyond simply paying taxes, when it comes to the systems of this world that we find ourselves in, we are to submit to the rule of the authorities placed over us. The Apostle Paul writes at length about this in Romans 13, but here are a couple of highlights. He says, let everyone be subject to the governing authorities, for there is no authority except that which God has established. The authorities that exist have been established by God. Consequently, whoever rebels against the authority is rebelling against what God has instituted, and those who do so will bring judgment on themselves. This is also why you pay taxes, for the authorities are God's servants who give their full time to governing. Give to everyone what you owe them. If you owe taxes, pay taxes. If revenue, then revenue. If respect, then respect. If honor, then honor. Right? Paul says that Christians are to submit to the rule of government because it is God who has allowed them to rule ultimately for his own purposes. So what of the Christian and civil disobedience? Right? Which has kind of been a bit of a hot topic maybe coming out of the last couple of years. Well, aside from one real exception that we'll get into in a minute, Christians should not be participating in civil disobedience. Right? The calling on the life of the Christian is to live out what, according to Galatians 5? The fruit of the Spirit. Right? And can I remind you that the list does not include the spirit of rebellion right? or the fruit of disobedience. Right? These are not of the Spirit of God. Right? And before we get all riled up about this, well, what about when injustices occur? What about rights and freedoms? What about my rights? Remember that Paul was writing to a church under a far more corrupt system than likely any of us will ever live under. Right? The Roman government was corrupt to the core and godless, celebrating amoral behavior, and killing Christians daily, right? That is the context in which Paul says, be subject to the governing authorities. Now, that is not to say that we don't care, 
right? That we don't speak up when we see injustices happen or that we don't seek to exact change when our government is acting in a way that is immoral, right? We do want to and are called to live as salt and light in the world, showing people what the kingdom of God looks like on this earth. But the way that that best happens is as when we live as a people of God who stand out in our culture because we are patient and kind and loving and hopeful and joyful, not bitter, angry, self-centered, and demanding. Should we pay taxes? Yes. Should we obey the law? Yes. Should we honor and all add pray for those God has put in leadership over us? Yes. Even when it's hard? Especially when it's hard. Even when the party I voted for isn't in power? Especially then. Right? Respecting and honoring those who we desire to respect and honor isn't really a big deal, is it? Right? Everyone does that. That's not from God. But asking God to help you respect and honor those who maybe you don't want to, those who you may disagree with, those whose actions affect you, maybe even oppress you, seeking to grow along the way in compassion and in your capacity to seek to be served and not to be served. Now that's something only God can do. And that's what we're called to for God's sake. Listen to what Peter writes. Peter was a guy who was in this very conversation we're studying this morning. And he says this. Submit yourselves, why? For the Lord's sake, to every human authority, whether to the emperor as the supreme authority or to governors who are sent by him to punish those who do wrong and commend those who do right. For it is God's will that by doing good you should silence the, the ignorant talk of foolish people. Live as free people, but do not use your free, for your freedom as a cover-up for evil. Live as God's slaves. Show proper respect to everyone. Love the family of believers. Fear God. Honor the emperor. Right? Living in submission, Peter says, to the worldly authorities is God's will for his people that he will ultimately be honored. Now, as I hinted at before, there are limited exceptions based on what Jesus has to say here, right? After Jesus affirms the legitimacy of human government, he continues in verse 17b. Jesus says, and, right, notice there's an and. They asked him, should we pay or shouldn't we? And he goes, give that, give Caesar, you know, what, what, give to Caesar what is Caesar's, and, right, he adds to it, and he says, and give back to God what is God's. And he says, while we're talking about what Caesar is due, what is in his rights to take, don't forget to give God what he is due. And in doing so, Jesus reminds everyone present that in the same way that Caesar has claimed to your coins, God has claimed to your entire life. You see, the denarius bears the image of Caesar. But what, according to the scriptures, bears the image of God? We do, right? We, we read this in the very first chapter of the scriptures, Genesis 1, God created mankind in his own image. In the image of God, he created them, right? Human beings are created in the image of God. God has stamped his image on us. And so Jesus is saying, that which has Caesar's image, give to Caesar. But that which has God's image, yourselves, give to God. Hold your money loosely because it's not really your own. And hold your life loosely because it is not your own. You, Jesus implies to the Pharisees in this popular, controversial conversation, have spent more time talking about what to do with your coins than you have about what to do with your life. Right? That's what you should be asking me. Not what we should give to Caesar, but rather, what should we give to God? How can we serve God better? How can I better align myself with his kingdom? Right? And this goes for us too, church. Are we so focused on our place in this world that we've forgotten about our place in God's kingdom? Right? Are we so focused on politics that we've missed the promise? 
And I think here, Jesus, while affirming government, puts politics in its place for the life of the believer. Here, Jesus puts an understanding of one's responsibility to the state within the ultimate understanding of one's responsibility to God. Right? Which means that the political realm must always be secondary and not primary in the life of the Christian. Right? The most important question for the Christian is not about taxes. It's not about national freedoms or rights and privileges or freedom of speech. The most important question for the Christian is about giving God his due with our lives. Right? The kingdom of this world is not to be our primary concern. It's the kingdom of God that should be our primary concern. And if you spend more time worrying about our government's policies than you do about your neighbor's salvation, it's a sign you might have that backwards. Or if you're more furious with the latest bill to be passed than you are about the grip of sin that the enemy has on humanity, you've got this backwards. If you spend more money on political campaigns or TV networks and newspaper subscriptions, all that keep you in the know politically than you do supporting the ongoing work of Christ in the world, you've got this backwards. Or if you more easily align yourself with political allies than you do with those brothers and sisters in Christ who may vote differently than you, you have this backwards. Unfortunately, over the last few years, We've had a lot revealed to us, haven't we? Jesus says here, the government is to be obeyed, right? We are to uphold our civil responsibilities, but they are not what we give our lives to. We are to give our lives to God and his work in the kingdom. Which brings us to the few exceptions that allow for civil disobedience. And there's no need to grab your pens. That's not what this is about. This isn't permission. If we find, right? Think about, think about what Jesus said. This is Caesar's, but this is God's. If we find that our ability to live for God, right, to give him what he is due, to love him and to love others, to invite others into relationship with him, if we find that doing that is impeded by the rule of land, if, if God clearly tells us something through his word and our local authorities say the opposite, or if the law of the land is keeping you from doing what you're commanded to in the scriptures, or if the government is forcing you to do something we are absolutely commanded not to, then and, th- and only then must we remember that our lives to gi- are given, to be given to God and submission to him is absolutely primary. Right? Scholar uh, Daniel Akin has this helpful expression. He says, obey the government as long as you can. Worship God as long as you live. Right? Obey the government as long as you can. Worship God as long as you live. Right? As long as both of these things are compatible, we are to do both. We are to worship God and we are to obey our earthly authorities. And in most circumstances, we will find ourselves there. But... If A prevents us from B, right, if we cannot give to God what is God's, if we cannot worship God, or if we're commanded to worship another God, then we abandon civil, dis- civil obedience, right? And we have biblical and historical precedent for this. In the book of Daniel, when prayer to God was outlawed, Daniel prayed anyway. Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego refused to obey a law that would have forced them to bow down and worship a golden image. In the book of Exodus, Hebrew midwives Shifra and Pua refused the king of Egypt's commands to kill every newborn male. Right? Throughout history, and even today, thousands of martyrs have refused to deny God or stop sharing the good news with others. Right? We do have historical precedent and biblical allowance. However, notice in these examples what their disobedience was about. Right? These were not just about personal rights and freedoms, fighting for their preferred way. In fact, in each and every one of these cases, they gave up their personal rights 
Right? They knew that breaking the law would cost them something and they were willing to receive the consequences for their actions. Right, Church, we do not disobey because we don't like a government or we don't like some policies or because the regime is hard on us or limits our comforts. We only disobey if following the law would make it impossible to submit to God and his word in the way that he is calling us to. Right? And I would suggest that the line for this is further than we may think. As Sinclair Ferguson writes, the man who is devoted to God does not make the issue of his political freedom the number one priority in his life. He knows that he can serve God freely in his heart under the most oppressive of regimes. Right? Seldom church. Does the line come when worshiping God fully cannot happen when still obeying our civil authorities? Right? It may look differently. It may be inconvenient. We live that out for a season. But our worship shouldn't be so rigid that if some details are changed, we find it impossible to do so. So to repeat Daniel Akin's saying, obey the government as long as you can and worship God as long as you live. Friends, if you can check these boxes, you can be sure that you're living in line with the scriptures and the desires of our God. May we be people who give to Caesar what is Caesar's and who willingly give ourselves that which belongs to God. To God. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you for hard texts We thank you for hard passages. We thank you that things aren't so straightforward that we can close this book and go off and do the next thing without even thinking about it. God, I pray that as we leave and as we ponder, you would work in our hearts and in our minds as we consider what it looks like to live out what it is that you have taught. God, help us to know. Lord, help us to be people who can submit Help us to to be people who live out the fruit of the Spirit and that our world sees light because we are in it. God, we also want to take this moment to pray for our brothers and sisters around the world who need to wrestle with this every single day and who live in fear simply because they're living their lives for you. God, we pray that you would give them boldness, that you would give them peace, that you would give them the ability to walk that line, Lord, to live the way that you have called them to live, Lord, but never abandoning what it is that you have said. So God, we pray that you would help us wrestle with this, and God, may you be honored in the way that we live, the way that we act, and in the way that we offer all of ourselves to you. Amen. Amen. Why don't you stand up?